Hello and welcome to another episode of the Magnetic Entrepreneur Podcast. Here we explore amazing, uh, extraordinary, talented uh, entrepreneurs who through living their passions and purpose enhance the life of others. My guest today is a two-time international best-selling author, celebrity speaker, life coach, successful entrepreneur, a multiple award-nominated international actress, and a Guinness World Record holder. She is insightful, delightful, with a plethora of information to share. Her mission to serve has taken her from the ghettos to Guyana, from the shelters to shut-ins, from Fort Mac and back. She is committed to being the change she wants to see happen in the world. It is absolutely my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cynthia Stone, Welcome, welcome on the podcast. Hello. Hi. <laughs> Such a pleasure to be on here. How you doing? I'm amazing. How are you? Excellent. So, so nice to have you here. Uh, I know that you're a busy lady and thank you so much for giving us your time so that we can get to know you better. Uh, I'd love to hear your story, Dr. Cynthia Stone. Where did you start? How did you get here? Oh, good question. We only have an hour. <laughs> okay, so let me do the sped up Reader's Digest version. Um, let's see. I started actually with a huge heart. I always knew that I wanted to help humanity. Um, I just naturally found myself, you know, helping people, like whether it was neighbors struggling, whether it was uh, people being bullied, whatever it happened to be. I just found that I was a natural ear and people came to talk to me and, you know, be with me in that capacity. And I ended up, you know, coming to that point in time where you have to decide what you want to be when you grow up. And I'm like, what? I don't know what to do. I mean, I also love to sing, you know, so being a kid, like I'm just like going back and forth, trying to figure it out. And uh, then one day I, I ended up watching the TV. I didn't watch a lot of TV as a child. So when I did see things, it really gripped me. And it was a World Vision commercial and my heart just broke. And I was just like, I want to do more. Like, I don't think it's fair. Um, so then my mom was really encouraging and she got me involved with an organization called Be'ahafta, the Canadian Jewish Humanitarian and Relief Committee, which is a very long name. But basically what it means is uh, Be'ahafta in Hebrew means you shall love. And so it was a beautiful organization that had me go to Guyana and do humanitarian work. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love doing this so much. I ended up working locally as well with the homeless. And that really opened my eyes to the suffering. Um, and so having grown up in the suburbs, I didn't see a lot of that. And so when I did, I was just like, no, I need to do more. This isn't right. People shouldn't be living on sidewalks and recovering from open heart surgery, you know, on the streets. So I uh, made it my business to commit myself to just be there in any capacity to help them on the road to, you know, being the best version of themselves. But what I found is that the longer you, the more you pour your energy into something and love and just want the best for someone they have to want it too you can't do it for them like the saying says that you can bring a horse to water but you can't make it drink and so i was trying to encourage them but it was uh, just a tireless pursuit and every night i would come home in tears just totally broken and feeling devastated and so i ended up turning it over to a higher power and praying and saying you know what here i am i was in social work at this point I had been doing it for probably 10 years, like just in shelters, working on the streets. And people kept saying, you know, you're going to burn out, you're going to burn out. And I just found that, you know, yeah, there was definitely a point in time where I was just like, I can't do it for them. What am I supposed to do? This isn't the answer. And so it was interesting because the next day I ended up going there 
uh, to the same homeless that I've been working with. And uh, they said, what are you doing with us? You should be in Hollywood. And I'm like, what? <laughs> what? Where did that come from? That was out of left field, right? So <laughs> I ended up uh, like doing everything else because I'm like, that's a really weird thing to say. But I noticed that no matter where I went, whether it was post Hurricane Katrina, whether it was, you know, at Georgetown, whatever it happened to be, they would put me on TV. And I'm like, you know what? There is something, definitely a pattern is emerging here. So I'm just going to throw caution in the wind and do it. And I ended up finding an infomercial on Kijiji, which is like Craigslist for people that aren't familiar with that and um ended up getting the part and that is unheard of apparently it doesn't work like that and so it was broadcast nationally and it was for a steam mop i call it my steamy debut <laughs> and <laughs> It was just so much fun. But then I heard from other actors that said, no, you can't do that. That's a fluke. Uh, look at me. I spent my life savings on Shakespearean studies and I live on a couch. And, you know, so all these negative influences started piling on, piling on. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> so then I was in like the wage slavery, like so many of us, you know, doing a job that I couldn't stand. At this point, I was in insurance. And that's where happiness comes to die. <laughs> and I was just like, no, why is everyone waiting for Friday? Like, why is it all about the weekend? It should be a strong beginning. <laughs> so yeah. then I decided, yeah, I was just like, you know what? I am just going to pursue my passion. So be it. There are no guarantees in this world. And I just want to be happy because at the end of the day, if I'm not happy, nothing else is going to be working for me either. So I ended up making that leap. You know, faith is all about taking that first step, even if you don't mm -hmm. see the whole staircase. <laughs> mm -hmm. And uh, I did it. Yeah. And I haven't looked back. It brought me incredible um, opportunities. Obviously, it has its peaks and valleys like anything. You know, the pay was sporadic. What am I going to do? Ah, safety nets are full of holes. But you can make it work when you have a why big enough. And for me, it was that search for happiness, that search for bliss. And I found it. And I was doing what I loved. I uh, ended up being afforded opportunities to work with like Iron Man and uh, going to the Emmys, Amir Khan, like just amazing opportunities. So feeling very blessed. And then, and then making the segue into the speaking world because they're like, you have a natural propensity to speak. You talk. You don't even need a script. So, <laughs> yeah, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> and that kind of led me into that whole world where I was just like encouraged to do a speaking contest. And I'm like, what? And it was a competition and I ended up placing, like I ended up being one of the top uh, winners and I was just blown away. And um, people were coming up after me and saying, you know, this really, you know, your words changed my life. And I was like, this is it. This just brought in all the fields together. And I'm like, I want to inspire people, empower people, be a change maker, you know, work towards, you know, betterment of society. And really, my, that's my overall vision now. So it's just bringing all these incredible realms together and, you know, working for positivity and change. Oh. So that's what I got here. <laughs> that's, that's wonderful. So tell me, um, so I, I'm sure that you've had people tell you, oh, you, you can't do it. This, like you said, you know, that was just by chance, beginner's luck. You know, what do you know about acting? What do you know about speaking? How do you get over stuff like that? Well, I think that it all comes down to your mindset. And I know that sounds cliche, but um, I think that for me, having started off in social work and working with people that were on the edge, and there were times where I didn't know if I was going to see them the next day, if they were going to go through with the suicide, if they were going to go through with, you know, um, going back to their abusive partner. And that to me was the most heart wrenching. And that was the hardest thing I ever had to face. Um, so now like, you know, dealing with rejection, like, I'm like, how can I be rejected from something that wasn't even mine? Like if it's meant to be, it's meant to be. So I really, um, you know, accept what is and I'm grateful for what comes my way. And recognizing that I came into this world with nothing, I'm going to leave with nothing. So I can choose either to hold on to things that aren't mine, or I can just be grateful for what comes my way. I mean, I realize all my blessings. And they say that the more you count your blessings, the more blessings you'll have to count. Oh, that's so good. I love that. I love that. You, you, I came into this world with nothing. I'm going to leave with nothing. I can choose to hang on to the things that aren't mine or be be grateful for the things that come my way. I love that. 
I love it. That should be a quote. Awesome. <laughs> Let's make it a quote. <laughs> <laughs> I love making up quotes. I, I, they're wonderful. Thank you so much. Tania, who was the biggest um, influence in your life? would you say, or you've had more than one, you can, you can tell us all. Yeah. Um, I would say actually, uh, Sadhguru was, um, a huge influence on my life. Um, I ended up when I was in the depths of despair and just wondering what am I doing with my life? Like how, you know, I'm not, you know, really bringing a lot of, um, pride to my family, for example, with the choices I've made. And uh, I don't fit in. I'm like a technicolor sheep in this world. You know? <laughs> so, um, you know, there was a lot of like brow beating and just being hard on myself. And what I found was when I started listening to Sadhguru's wisdom on inner engineering and mastering yourself to be the master of your you know, world and just really being, you know, when you're at peace and happy with who you are, everything around you changes. And so he was so instrumental. He helped me heal and just be uh, more present and more grateful. I just find his wisdom so beautiful, so enlightening. He, he's a gift from God. Like, I'm just so grateful. Um, there have been other influences for sure, but I'd say he was the person that got me through, like, the hardest times in my life. I would just turn on the, you know, YouTube University or read, you know, some of his literature and just find myself transported. And they say often, like, if you can't find a support network around you that's living, like, you, uh, or that's within easy access, like, you can always, you know, read the written word or listen to it. And uh, I'm so grateful for this virtual world we're in because even though I've never met him, I feel like I've known him my whole life. <laughs> that's crazy. Uh, do you remember that single moment of when you woke up? Like, I, I call it the, the spiritual awakening. Um, some people call it the breakthrough. Some people call it the breakdown. Um, yeah. that, that moment when um, you decided that no longer were you going to live in victimhood and you were going to change. Uh, I would say it came to be when I was in a 10-day silent meditation. And people were like, I can't even believe you were silent for 10 minutes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> where, where did you do that? Um, it was at uh, the Pasana Resort, just up north of Barrie. Here in like half an hour away from me. Yeah. Oh, right on. <laughs> amazing. So good. Because they say the root of all man's suffering lies in not being able to sit in a room by oneself. And I was just like, oh my gosh. Like the first three days are agony because you have to face yourself. And mm -hmm. for most of us, we're either going through aversion or addiction. We're running from something or running to something. And then I was like forced to look at my life and I was in an unhappy relationship. I was in an abusive relationship, but it wasn't so much about him. It was about me. Mm -hmm. I was my own worst enemy. Like I had not conquered myself. So it forced me to really look and wake up, like get the shake up, wake up, you know, and just like, what are you doing? No, and that inner voice that, you know, whispers or like, you know, prods you, it was yelling at me. It was a full on, like, you know, <laughs> wake up, what are you doing? Leave. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah, break free. So that was when I realized, you know, one of my core heart virtues is liberty. And it's just being free, free to be. And uh, I, I took that step, like, whew. And it was a challenge because uh, being in... Uh, a marriage is something very sacred, obviously, and I, I hold that very strongly. But when you are not, uh, when you don't know yourself and when you're seeking outside of yourself, then it will never be a fulfilling experience. And I'm like, if I'm feeling incomplete and unfulfilled, how is he feeling? And I think the best thing we can do is just go our separate ways and just, you know, move forward powerfully. But that was incredibly hard. And so I remember just like, oh my gosh, I can't do it. I can't do it. I can't do it. And then just, I'm like, how will I do it? Then it went from like, can't to how will I? And then it went to, okay, I'm going to do this. And the answer will come. And sure enough, after the 10 days, I got a call on my phone, no word of a lie. And there was no cell service, right? So it was literally right when I walked out the door of the Vipassana, a guy named Moses was on the phone for me. <laughs> was like okay talk about a sign what is that you know and he's like you have uh 
a lead role in Africa. And I was like, what? And I'm like, what do you mean I have a lead role in Africa? He's like, yeah, you're going to go be leaving on a jet plane on September 11th <laughs> to go to Zimbabwe. And I'm like, how did this happen? What is going on? And it was so interesting because a beautiful soul that I had befriended years ago, and that's how the universe works. Like, you just never know. It's like we're all connected by this golden string, you know? And uh, she was such an influence, a beautiful soul. Like, she had... Um, the the power the vision uh to really pursue her passion and she's a very prolific film writer she's won multiple awards uh just a, an amazing person and so she had actually put my name in for this you know movie and had spoken about me because we had done a movie together and they were like so blown away they're like well if she's saying it okay <laughs> And next thing I know, I'm in Zimbabwe. And it was just amazing. And at that point, I had left my marriage. I was starting again and just like, wow. And what an incredible experience that was. So I would say that definitely woke me up and, and feeling like the African soil under my feet. And they say we all originated in Africa. I don't know about all that, but I do know that when my feet touched that soil and I connected heart to heart with these beautiful beings, I was blown away. I was like, oh my gosh, I'm home. What an experience. Holy moly. I know, right? Oh, what? <laughs> so it's it's like um you're you're open to all these new adventures because for a lot of people you, you tell them you have to go to Z Zimbabwe. No, I'm not going to anywhere <laughs> near that continent, right? Like anywhere outside my comfort zone, because that's a big big leap. But you are open to it. Were you, were you always open to adventures? Always. For as long as I can remember, I always just said yes. I'm like, I just want to experience life and have all these awesome new opportunities. And like, it never occurred to me that, you know, to be afraid or anything like that. I've just always been carefree, joie de vivre, like just lost like a fart in the wind, <laughs> flowing around, you know, but am I lost or am I found? I mean, sometimes you have to like have all these like, experiences just to know yourself like we are limitless beings but we're trapped in these you know these bodies these costumes we've rented out you know so it's just like all right well you know on to the next adventure why not mm -hmm. life is short and i want to embrace every moment that amazing so what's your um you, what's your biggest tool in your toolbox when when it comes to um being adventurous and and just saying you know I, i'm just going to do this and let's see what happens what's your biggest tool what do you trust what do you count on to um, help you guide absolutely i think that it's it's the faith piece like imagination can work one of two ways it's either it's going to be negative and draw you into the paranoia and the fear or you can tap into that like childlike state of un, you know fearless faith and just knowing that you know you were you are designed you are a divine creation and if you are created in that creator's image that there's a big purpose for you in this life and just to you know embrace the moment and just trust the process and trust that you know you're you're not alone in this world like i think so often we we become like so self-conscious that we forget that it's not about self at all that we are being refined, that, you know, these experiences are meant to, to groom us. They say that when you're um, doing the refining process on silver, they're holding up the silver above the flame, and you only know it's done when you can see your reflection in it. And like that, we are created in the reflection of the master creator. So I'm like, all I have to do is just keep going through these, these experiences and pass the test, go to the next level and become more and more like the creator, you know, just be the best version of myself. Like just recognize that, you know, there is no competition. If anything, I'm in competition with myself. I'm just trying to be the best possible me. And really I recognize, like, I think that deep down my truth is that I am love. I am you know originated from love and that the purpose of life is to find that love and remove all the barriers to that love so you can just be love 
And once you do that, like love is the most powerful force on earth. There's nothing that can o ever overcome that. Like it's just so powerful. And I think that that's really what we have to strive for, that to have the power of love overcome the love of power. And then we'll have a very different world, a very different society. Oh, another golden um, piece. To have the power of love overcome the love of power. Where do you get these? Holy moly. <laughs> so <good. laughs> okay, thank you. Um, how do you look at um, failure and success? Um, I would say that there is no failure, that we are constantly going through stepping stones to our greatness. That if you look at it, like from your very birth, you were born a winner. Like you beat out all the other sperm. Like it's true, you know. Come on now. And then you like were that kid that kept falling on your face, and they're like, they're never going to walk. And look at you now. You're walking. You're running. You're leaping. You're jumping. You're going up those stairs. Do you have any idea how complicated that is? <laughs> like, to go up the stairs. Like that's that's major. You know. So I think we don't realize that we're actually always winning, but we look at it, we beat ourselves up for perceived failures, but nothing has any meaning except the meaning you attach to it. Like I remember reading a quote where, um, I think it was Edison who like tried like umpteen times, like thousands of times for the light bulb and finally he got it right. And they're like, don't you feel like a failure? He's like, no, I just figured out 9,999 ways to, how not to do it. You know, yeah. <laughs> I'm just yeah. learning. And that's, that's the key is that we're constant, we're under construction and that we are going to, you know, have um, areas for growth. You can either go with the flow or grow with the flow. I really believe in growing with the flow. And if you stop growing and you stop trying, then you're dead. Because really, what does death mean? It's, it's, the, ability, it's the inability to respond. And so we have an option where we can respond in a different way and we can choose. Like that's one of the beauties of being a human is that we have that conscious ability to choose how we take things and change our perspective so if you're constantly looking at yourself as a failure oh there i go again well guess what you're going to be a failure whatever you think you are so be really careful with your thoughts and your words because they are shaping your reality whether you like it or not i love that go growing with the flow yeah. and not going with the i i mean i you know i always say I'm, i i go with the flow but you're so right it's it's more like i grow with the flow because we, we're never the same we're constantly changing oh that how'd you get so smart <laughs> <laughs> that's so good so good um so Cynthia, what is what are some tools that you use on a daily basis to keep you grounded? Mm. Yeah, it's funny because my dad's name is Clay Stone. Like, how down to earth can you get? <laughs> and here I am, like, la la la, like always, like fluttering <laughs> around. Um, but yeah, I definitely think that um, I've met like the love of my life now who is like my my ball and chain. Like, he's very good at like bringing me back to reality. And I think that you know. We're complete in and of ourselves, but you know, it's always nice to have that frosting on your already complete cake. And, and he's that for me, like he really helps me to just like, woo saw, but if he's not there and he's not always there, um, really what's uh, crucial is to recognize that you are not your thoughts. You are not your emotions. You are not the circumstances that happen to you. You are not your skin color. You are not your religion. Like you are a witness, really. I mean, if you ever notice like you're in that lucid dream state, and you're aware you're dreaming, but you're not woken up, but you're in that state, that's your true nature. That's like the inner peace and bliss that we can achieve. And a lot of people can do that through meditation and things like that. And so when I find that I'm getting really like, woo, I just focus on my breath and, and become a witness to my breath and start noticing. Because if you're ever in a state of anxiety, for example, your breath changes. Mm -hmm. If you're in a state of fear, your breath changes. So if you can like, focus, like change your focus and just be present with that, 
then it allows you to be in the present moment. So you're not forward thinking or backward thinking, you just are. And that's the best place to be. And that's the ultimate grounding. And so there's a technique I learned, apparently it's Harvard or whatever. So it's gotta be smart. <laughs> and um, it's like you breathe in and then you exhale twice as long. And that actually changes your physiological state. So you become like more calm, more wusa, and it will actually shift you completely. Cool. Yeah. Oh, um, so I learned something called, uh, I forget what it's called, uh, alternative nostril breathing or something like that. That reminds me of that because it makes you actually think about what you're doing. Um, so yeah, I can see how that could be beneficial. That's so good. Um, can you talk about your upcoming book a little bit? Absolutely. Yeah, I'm super excited. Um, it's called From Plenty to Empty, and people are like, what? That's really backwards. It's supposed to be from empty to plenty. But I'm like, no, because um, when they talk about how, um, like there was a monk, for example, and he was approached by somebody who wanted his wisdom, and he basically started pouring the water into this guy's cup, and it went overflowing. And the guy was like, wait, it's, it's overflowing. It's going everywhere. And the, he was like, well, that's because it's hard to, you know, grasp new information when your cup's already full. So my goal in life is really to empty myself from a lot of what I've accumulated so that I can just be. Because we are what we ingest. Whether it's your food intake, whether it's what you watch on TV, whether it's what you read. And I really felt that during that 10 day silent meditation, because I had watched like a marathon on Netflix. Oh my gosh. And it was just like infiltrating me. And I'm like, this is wow. You know, and that's exactly what happens is we tend to replay what's happened in our past. And our mind is this constant, you know, going, thinking about the future or thinking about the past and not really allowing you to just be. So when you empty yourself, it allows yourself to just be. And I really want to get us from being human doings to human beings. So it's called from from plenty to empty and how to design your destiny and so it's really you know looking at our divine connection to align with our divine to silence our mind and to be really present to to cultivate that inner peace and bliss that really that's what we're all seeking everything we do in our life we are pleasure seekers we are always looking to find new ways to derive pleasure and if you can just have that cultivated within, that eliminates all of that. And then you can just be happy in the moment. That way, during a quarantine, when you can't go outside, you can just be inside. And that's fine because you are so content with your home, which is you. So when is your book coming out? Um, that should probably be in the next, I believe it should be in the next couple of months. Uh, we're finalizing it up and then I'm going to be meeting with the publisher very soon. So I'm excited. <laughs> exciting. exciting. Very exciting. Um, so, um, what I was going to ask you was, uh, was also your experience as a, a skill coach, because that's what you do mm -hmm. and you help people all the time, um, with, uh, with, your experience so tell me what first of all how would someone reach you absolutely i would say um i'm giving away a free gift so it's a great way to reach me that way as well it's a free gift dot relationshifter dot com so you can go there and get like a breakthrough guide which is just gives you a glimpse of who i am and what i can do for you and I have my site, Cynthia360.com, and that has all of the different ways to reach out to me. So whether you're a WhatsApp person or Facebook, whatever it happens to be, it's all there. It's the one-stop shop. <laughs> okay, perfect, perfect. So um, tell me, tell me um, an experience with some, someone you helped out that kind of comes to your mind, just as somebody who came to you and said, you changed my life you helped change my life and the reason why i'm asking this is because one of the best things i did for myself was um to take on a coach um this is going back now a few years ago she helped me see um life in, from a totally different perspective and i can't um i can't persist and insist on on this everyone needs a coach 
And so, right? So, and you're a coach. I'm sure you have a coach and your coach has a coach, right? <laughs> so it's so important to, to have this help. So what does, first of all, you as a coach, what do you do for people? And can you think of a, a, a story that you can share with us that's heartwarming? Absolutely. I put you on the spot there. Yeah, right. And I'm like, oh, so funny. but there was actually one that comes to mind where um, he had been um, a very tough guy. And I think that men have it really difficult because their condition, you know, men don't cry and they kind of suppress a lot and put on this mask. I mean, during this time of masks, we're all putting on masks, but metaphorically, we've been putting on masks from, for time immemorial. And I think that that is, you know, the root to a lot of suffering is, you know, putting on that false face. Uh, so he had projected this image of being this tough guy, but in reality, there was an injured soul in there. Um, and I saw it. Uh, that's part of, uh, I guess, my gifts is being that empath and feeling people. And uh, he felt comfortable in talking to me and his mask fell off and he was very real and he had been um, abused, um, yeah, for, for years uh, from his father uh, sexually and it was definitely something that he carried with him and was very limiting um, and so it created a lot of anger in him and so I helped him to go back into that time, that period where he was that helpless child and and actually with his wisdom now, what he would say to that child. So it's a neuro-linguistic programming technique that um, you can do when you're able to, you know, so just project the future onto the past. It's very powerful. So what happened was he ended up in undergoing this huge experience where he was just like convulsing and you know and and ended up giving that child the words the 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 safety the warmth the love that he had craved he became the father that he always wanted to that child and i think it's so important to remember that our parents all go to the same university that's right there is no university and then a lot of times we become uh, victimized and we start replaying it like a bad movie. And like any movie, if you watch a movie in a theater that you don't like, for example, you're gonna walk out or you're not gonna watch it anymore. But for some reason, we feel the need that we can torture ourselves for years. I mean, he was 50 something and this happened when he was four. So you can see that that's over four decades of torture that he was carrying with him. Um, so when he was able to do that, he felt a shift happen. Um, then from there, um, he had extreme homophobia, obviously, and hated, um, you know, people that, you know, swung to that direction. And I ended up showing him a movie that had been very, like, powerful when I saw it, which was called Soldier's Girl. And after he saw that, he let himself just completely um, fall apart. And that was really beautiful because as you fall apart, you come back in this new, um, this new dimension, if you will. And he was so moved by that movie. And for those of you who haven't seen it, I highly encourage it. He ended up writing um, a letter to the woman that survived and um, just expressed how terrible he felt for years of bashing of beating and all these things and how that story moved him so much that he is now committed he is an advocate he is doing amazing beautiful work and i feel like i mean i i don't think i can take credit for his transformation i believe that there was a channel and i was connected to something larger than myself and that's what i do is i just want to help people become the best versions of themselves and break free and that's what he did he looks different now he is embodying a new life a joie de vivre he's not carrying around this anger this pain it's completely shifted i consider it a holy shift <laughs> wow. I like that. yeah and so it was really really beautiful so that's uh, one of the success stories wow that's amazing yeah. Yeah. In, in your opinion, what keeps men from reaching out for help? I think that definitely they've been conditioned that they don't need to, that they're strong, 
that, you know, like even as a child, when a, a boy like scrapes his knee and starts crying, it's like, get up, you're a man, you know? <laughs> and it's like, you know, they're, they're conditioned. Yeah. That, you know, you don't, you don't share your pain. You don't have pain because supposedly with this man costume, they are different uh, and they don't need that. But in reality, it's, you know, they, they do feel it and, and there tends to be like a lot of suppression. And now with the gender role stereotypes being what they are, I, I see a lot of women experiencing the same thing, trying to put on these, these man type, you know, characteristics uh, throughout life. And it's just really doing a disservice because deep down, we're all a soul and we need to love and be loved. That is the natural human condition. And, you know, to remember that we're spiritual beings having a human experience. But yeah, I definitely think that the issues are in the tissues, you know, and sometimes you need a good cry and it's hard uh, as a man, like, you know, you don't show your tears, you don't, they're considered weakness. And that's the paradigm we're operating in. Whereas when people cry in front of me and often they feel very embarrassed and I remember what one man told me when I felt embarrassed crying in front of him when I saw, uh, when I was working with the homeless and he said, your tears are beautiful. And that really stuck with me. It's like, you know, they are nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, if anything, if you look at the science behind it, it's the toxins that are releasing from you. Mm -hmm. And it's, you know, really a powerful way that your body heals. And I think we're very patient with the physical healing, you know, like if we bruise, we understand it takes time and it's going to get better and we start seeing it. But emotionally, we need the same kind of recuperation and recognizing that our body is going to go through these stages, but it knows what it's doing. Mm -hmm. Just to let it be. And care, right? Like you, that, I think that's a great analogy um, that treating it like you would a physical bruise and take care of it and keep it um you know sanitized and and clean it right like it's just so good so good um what do you think um is the danger uh, underlying this um this issue that if, if people don't reach out i mean men if they don't reach out what can happen what could possibly happen to someone with a deep emotional wound if they don't reach out and try to um alleviate it I think we definitely see a lot of that, especially now where people become numb and they're not even alive. Like a lot of people are, you know, live until 25 and then are on a slow form of suicide where they stop responding. And I think that that's, you know, that's death. And, and it's really, really sad. You do see a lot of it where people just like, you know, they just go through the motions. It's almost like a zombie state. And, um, you know, it's really, really tragic where they neither feel joy nor feel pain. They're just going through, doing what they need to do, you know, almost like a machine, like on autopilot, having lost connection to what is. And it's, it's tragic. Mm -hmm. So I think it's really important that we catch that before it comes and hopefully it's not too late, you know. Um, how do we approach someone that we feel needs help, um, but they can't really see it themselves. Maybe they don't have the right insight. What's, a, what's some things we can say to that person that can maybe direct them to, to seeking help on their own? Because I know you can't really force anyone to get help. Um, that's up to them. But is there, is there some way we can, we can approach someone who we think might be in uh, danger? I would say to, to show interest, to show your love, like the, more than anything you do, people will always remember how you make them feel. And so if you come at it from your heart center, and if you are somebody who is, um, you know, spiritually inclined, who believes in a higher power, you know, say that prayer for them before you go in and ask to, you know, have them work through you. Um, just recognize that, you know, they're going to feel your your heart more than hear your words. And it, I, I noticed that it really helps when you're engaged and you're asking them questions because people, the favorite subject of people is to talk about themselves, you know, <laughs> like, so are you like, I, I noticed, you know, like a few years ago you were so happy and then I don't see you have quite the same, like, how are you doing? Like, you know, or 
Are you, are you on a path that you're happy with? What are your goals? What are your ambitions? Oh my gosh. I notice that when you do this, you get really excited, but I don't see you doing that as often. Like just like observations, queries, you know, gentle prods, um, you know, like let's go out and do something fun. Like when was the last time you did that? You know, and just like try to get them reconnected. Um, spending time in nature is so helpful. Like just being barefoot on the grass and having those negative ions go through and being near water, if you can do that, oh, it's so healing. So I would say just uh, do li little things like that, thoughtful things like, oh, I got you your favorite chocolate, you know, just little things to bring them joy. And I think it's kind of like my work with the homeless is all I can think of is that a lot of them don't trust people at all. And so what we do is we keep showing up and we keep offering, we keep offering, we keep offering. And eventually it becomes almost like fatigue for them. It's like, all right, I'm just going to say yes. <laughs> and so it's like, I think it's just really being persistent and recognizing that you can't force it, but if you show that continued interest and you come with that intention that you just want to help and, um, you know, really come from that place of love, that that is your best shot. Thank you. You're welcome. And the, the world can use so much empathy. Um, you know, there's so many people uh, on, on the streets and there's so many people who need the help. And for a lot of us, we pass them by and yes, it, it, it might hurt us. Um, it might hurt us. It might touch uh, the nerve. But um, to actually step out of our comfort zone and do something, um, that's a hard thing to do for a lot of people. So what what's one small thing that someone can do if they want to start helping um but they don't have your superpowers what 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 can what can we do what what can someone do that's like you know it's not too too out of their comfort zone i would say uh, there's a quote i'm reminded of if someone doesn't have a smile give them one of yours mm -hmm. a smile is um the beginning of love and just whatever way that works for you, however to show love, even if it's just holding open the door for someone or saying a, a kind word to someone. Um, I had one guy tell me that uh, during this uh, COVID you know, experience, he, he saw how the frontline grocery store clerks were being just bombarded by all this negativity. And he's very shy and he doesn't like interaction, but he took the time to write them each a thank you letter for all they did. And he gave it to the supervisor and it really shifted them. Like he saw an amazing improvement. Just, uh, you know, uh, there was one lady that told me that she was in line and somebody was giving one of the clerks uh, crap. And then uh, he ended up buying a bouquet of flowers and having it sent there um, to, that, to that worker. Um, just doing kind things. Like if you have a neighbor that's struggling to, you know, um, eat or whatever maybe picking up the groceries one day just little things like whatever you can do donating to a charity um for my birthday for example i did what like facebook had this like gentle prod and they're like do you want to start a fundraiser and i'm like that's a great idea you know so i ended up like fundraising for my favorite charity well i don't really have a favorite charity but it's one that i'm working with and it's the tony robbins basket brigades and tony robbins story was really beautiful too and this is speaking to that as well um he started this charity because he wasn't always the big deal he is now mm -hmm. and he was hungry he was actually they were they were starving in their home and his father was too proud to ask for a handout and he was not able to work. And then I guess it must have caught the attention of one of the neighbors because on Thanksgiving, he knocked on the door and the father opened the door and he had a basket full of food and he gave it to them. And his father was too proud and shut the door and whatever. But what struck Tony at that moment wasn't how his father reacted. It was the fact that a total stranger would care. Mm -hmm. And that was really what started this whole movement called the Basket Brigades. And so what, what they do is they feed the hungry. And, and now with the quarantine, we've been going out pretty much every week with basketfuls of food for the hungry. And it's something like if you don't want to be on the front lines, you can still be behind the scenes, maybe helping to create the baskets or, you know, 
whatever it happens to be, if you're belonging to a church, a mosque, a synagogue, whatever it happens to be, just get involved with however you can. Um, there are so many ways that you can just spread joy, even if it's as simple as smiling at someone and saying a kind word. It's yeah. truly remarkable. Yeah. So good. Um, and you, you believe that in order for change to happen in the world, you have to start changing yourself. And yes. That's that's so true. That's so true. There's so many things that are out of our control, but what we can control, like you said, uh, it's uh, whatever's going on in here. <laughs> right. Between the two ears, the six inches here, this is prime real estate. You got to like, sometimes you got to, you know, do a little bit of, um, you know, some head office. Uh, <laughs> yeah, 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 for sure. Yeah. Amazing. It's so good. Um, so what, like we're out of time, my friend, uh, we've been talking for, <laughs> I know, I know, time flies when you have fun. So yeah. I want to give you a few minutes because I know you're, you're, you're just filled with knowledge and you're just so, um, you're so energetic and you're so enthusiastic about life. I just love that about you. Uh, you bring a lot of joy into the world. Um, and I want to thank you. Is there, are there any last few um, sentences that you want to leave with you know what do you want people to know what do you want to leave today? I would say to to really appreciate this time that you have on this earth it is limited we all come with you know a limited time and so it's really about being a conscious creator and choosing wisely I mean having worked with people at the end of their lives I heard so much regret and it's really crucial that you start living as though every day matters just as much as the next because really when it comes down to your final days do you want to perish with a life that you can cherish or do you want to go with a frown having let yourself down the key is really to find those gifts that you have been granted and to share them with the world. Find your passion, find your voice, and just rejoice. I love it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm gonna listen to this podcast a few more times and just jot down everything you said. You got a lot of beautiful, um, beautiful words there. Thank you so much, Dr. Stone. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, again, that website is freegift.relationshifter.com. It's right above you. It's very <laughs> handy. <laughs> cheat, cheat. Uh, and so um, I want to wish you the best in your endeavors with your upcoming book. Uh, I know, I know that the, um, Ah, your life, your life is just getting better and better and better and better because of the energy you put out into the world. And I want to thank you for that. Thank you. And again, again, I want to thank you for giving us your time um, to be here on the podcast and share some of your beautiful soul with everybody else. Uh, and uh, so this is Dr. Cynthia Stone sharing her knowledge with the Magnetic Entrepreneur Podcast. And my name is Della. Have a nice day and be safe and stay well and mwah. Mwah! <laughs> <laughs> Bye. Bye.